And now it's my pleasure to welcome Harvey Childers, who will be introducing our speaker for the day. Is it the truth? Yes. <laughs> Let me say I feel extremely honored to uh, be able to introduce Samara. My gosh, with the family members here and the, I mean, dignitaries in the audience who knew Willard well, uh, I just I just feel extremely honored to, to, be, to be able to do this. As many of you know, I spent the last 40 years of my career with the Garveys, and in particular the Willard Garvey family, and, and uh, the Willard and Jean Garvey fam family, must I say. Most of the achievements and rewards in my life and my family's life, I owe directly or indirectly to the Garveys, <clears throat> and I shall be forever grateful for them, and I love them for it. Now about Mara's and the book, Willard Garvey and Epic Life. I think all of you saw copies out here. Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> All of the family members have made significant contributions to the book, but it was Julie Garvey's inspiration and close friendship with the author that brought this book to fruition. <clears throat> and of course, a book is not a book until it's published, and it was Mary Garvey, Thoreau's, and, and David, who are in the audience here, <clears throat> their Independent Institute and the Liberty Tree Network in San Francisco that got it published, and we are very grateful to them for that. As the saying goes, Success has a million authors, so let me be quick to say that the success of this book would not have happened except for Maura McEnany, whom we welcome here today. For those of you who knew Willard, just imagine, if you will, the enormous task of bringing Willard's diverse, controversial, worldwide, and multicultural activities into focus so that I can tell you the book reads like a John Gresham novel. Once you pick it up, you won't want to put it down. <laughs> I've already had three people tell me that since, since, since they had, had read the book. <clears throat> Mara's bio appears on the book cover, and it's also in this week's Rotary newsletter. But let me tell you more. She is an accomplished author, an award-winning business writer, and, and editor for 30 years. And she is the recipient of a Pulitzer Prize gold medal for a project she did with the Akron, Ohio Beacon Journal. I have known Mara for many years. She has a warm, engaging personality, and you will be glad to know her too. Please welcome and give a warm rotary welcome to Mara McEnany, author of Willard Garvey and Epic Life. Everybody. Thank you, Harvey. Thank you, Gail. Thanks to everybody for coming today. Just don't wave that finger at me if I can think of it. it makes me a little crazy. <laughs> but it's enthusiastic, and that's good. You know, uh, I wanted to thank Harvey, too. He really was a reporter's dream. Um, he was always available when I came to talk to him. He had a great memory, and plus, in the end, he told me he liked the book. So. Um, I want to thank Patty Brown, too, who helped put this together. This is really the big show in Wichita, i got to tell you. Everybody said, you're going to Rotary, you're going to Rotary, you know. I, What's going to happen to Rotary? Oh my God. <laughs> so I am here at the big show and happy to be here, let me tell you. We have special guests today, too, Mary and David Thoreau. I want to thank them a great deal of the Independent Institute and Liberty Tree Press. As Harvey told you, they were the publishers of this book. I so appreciate the hard work that Mary and David did to make this book happen, and I know the effort they made to be with us today, so thank you guys. And thanks to the uh, clan in the front row here, you know, always ever supportive, uh, always, always supportive, and told me that I could do it even when it seemed like I didn't want to do it anymore. <laughs> and they, you know, it, 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 came, it came to be, so I'm happy to share some of it with you today. But I also bring greetings from Medford, Massachusetts Rotary. Uh, which is Medford is about uh, five miles north of Boston. As it turned out, it's a population of about 55,000. And when I was writing this book, I subleased uh, a 10 by 10 office space from a local architect who was, in fact, a one-term Rotary president, and now he's uh, signing up for a second term. So 
He told me before I came, when I told him I was coming to speak to one of the most prestigious and oldest and certainly friendliest, I know, uh, uh, rotaries in uh, Wichita, maybe, maybe bigger. Um, he said, Mark, keep it short. These people are on their lunch break. <laughs> So, but I, I did hear an awful lot about Rodi. I'm glad to hear you guys don't find each other the way some of those groups do. But, well, Willard Garvey sure didn't know how to keep it short. I, th I think some of you en endured that as well. But he was a faithful Rotarian for more than 50 years, and this was his club. He joined Rotary in 1950, and you could usually find him here without fail on Mondays. If he was out of town, he often made it a point to visit with other Rotary clubs like we had today and around different cities in the United States. Will Willard really loved Rotary and it came clear through all the speeches that he had. And I had two books of speeches that I went through and he gave an awful lot of speeches here at Rotary. I know in July of 2002, this group gave him the Service Above Self Award and it was something I know that meant a lot to him and to his family members that are here today. So I just want to get an idea of who I'm dealing with out here. Just for kicks, how many of you knew Willard or thought you knew him? Okay, so that's a good crowd. Uh, I came to find out, really, that he was, he was many things to many people. The book tried to capture some of his many facets of his epic life, as Willard had uh, certainly had, was a man with epic ideas, he had epic ambitions, and he had epic achievements. When friends asked me to tell them the story, you know, I'm from back east, and when friends told me to tell them a story about a man I was writing about, I didn't really know how to s describe it quickly. So I told them he was sort of a sophisticated Forrest Gump character <laughs> who witnessed and experienced key moments in, in American and world history. And because Willard had such a worldly character and was so involved in so many dis different facets of business and life, I needed to move him through history, so I sort of did that. In the book, we learn about the pioneering spirit of Willard's ancestors, the angst of the Great Depression, and the dirty 30s era known as the Dust Bowl. He talks about the uncertainties of war on a family and its community, and the communist scare of the mid 20th century, among other things. So this book is really not only a story of Willard's life, it's an American story, and it's seen through the eyes of an independent Kansas entrepreneur. Now, Willard came from some pretty good stock. He was the oldest son and the second of four children born to Ray and Olive Garvey, the farming, oil, grain, elevator moguls who were in the Kansas Business Hall of Fame out in Topeka. His parents had their own fascinating histories, and I touch upon some of that in the book. But Willard started his life, uh, he lived for eight years in Colby, Kansas, which is about 290 miles north and west of here, I think, if I got that right, and where his father, Ray Garvey, launched the massive wheat and farming business. In 1928, mostly at the urging of Olive, they brought the family here to Wichita. Olive thought that the children needed better schooling and a little bit more of an urban environment. So he came here in 1928. He stayed here, he raised his family here, and he died here in 2002. Willard liked to say that uh, he loved Wichita because it was the furthest he could get from both coasts. <laughs> Some of you might feel that way too. But it was his love for this community and the impact he had here and elsewhere went well, well beyond that. As head of Garvey Industries and its subsidiaries, Builders Inc., Petroleum Inc., Garvey International, and Nevada First Corp, to name a few, Willard wore many hats. But he called himself a builder. And if you look around town, you can see that he did just that. He began with Ray building those small World War II brick homes that you see in apartments around town for returning veterans. He went on to big, uh, builder, bigger developments like Bonnie Bray out east and uh, commercial properties like Park Lane, which was one of the first shopping plazas in Wichita. In the light, late 1980s, he had a vision, or maybe he was crazy enough, the only one crazy enough, to build the Epic Center, downtown's tallest building, with the hope that it would become a beacon for downtown revitalization. He lost the building, and something like $5 million in the process, like two years after it was built. But he never regretted building that project. In northern Nevada, where I first ran across him working in my first newspaper job right out of college in a town called Winnemucca, Nevada. 
that's another story, but uh, <laughs> Willard was a rancher who spoke out against the Bureau of Land Management, and he built the state's largest private dam and reservoir, creating a valuable resource for his lands in the process. It's really a beautiful place today. He dabbled in the newspaper and television business and a host of other investments that grabbed his attention along the way, including something like a, a flour mill in Trinidad. I wonder if you guys ever got an exchange from Trinidad. When fears of creeping communism became a global focus in the early 1960s, he launched a, a project called World Homes, an innovative overseas housing project in third world countries, such as Peru, India, Mexico, and Bolivia. And what he wanted to do there, uh, if he felt that if you made people capitalists, you would help thwart communism. And he set out to, this program's motto was to make every man a capitalist, every man a homeowner. And uh, just as an aside on that, Wichita State University has an amazing collection of the World Homes documents. There's 100 boxes of documents over there that are stored in a salt mine in Hutchinson, Texas, uh, Hutchinson, Kansas. And um, it, it, it's just an amazing resource of what Willard did in many, many countries around the world. I only used a few examples of it to try to show some of the things he was going through at that time. Now, to some in this room, Willard Garvey was an employer but not always an easy man to work for. <laughs> right, Harvey? A philanthropist. He was a strict father. Or a commanding, grand, a commanding grandfather. He was most certainly a devoted husband who would check in with his beautiful wife, Jean, every day at 5.30 on his way home from work to see if she needed anything for him to pick up on the way home. Some ve vehemently disagreed with his anti-government views and walked the other way when they saw him coming. <laughs> You know who you are. <laughs> Don't wave those fingers again. No. Uh, <laughs> others saw him as a profiteering businessman who criticized government, yet welcomed federal money to programs that would support his projects. Uh, what Willard would say in response to that, which is what his father, Ray, said, is we operate under the program. We don't set it. Newspaper readers may have also cringed when they saw his caustic letters to the editor about socialist public schools. He chose to support and, and launch two private schools here in town, uh, one with, in collegiate with the Bob Love family and others, and later the independent school, with Gene leading away on that effort. In his, and it was in his front yard out east. I was just out there, and they have a beautiful new football field. It's getting closer and closer and closer to the Garvey home. It's just a beautiful thing. <laughs> It's nice to see it uh, going so well. But he was never too busy for Wichita. He headed up campaigns to stop bond issues for public projects such as the new jail, and he fought any and all new taxes. Most news stories about his efforts began with the words, millionaire Willard Garvey is opposing, or proposing. <laughs> but to others, Willard really epitomized the spirit of Kansas. Uh, he was a true entrepreneur who could spit out ideas rapid fire. Uh, there was put a fish farm at the grain elevators or a TV program to teach people how to train dogs long before Caesar, Caesar Milan came along. Or even let's start our own country. Our own country. That was, and that's, uh, yeah. Uh, Bob White, an executive at, uh, at Garvey, said to me, Willard had 10,000 more ideas than the time he had to put them into action. And there was another story that CFO Bob Page told, I guess he had to introduce himself to a group of people once, and he said, my job each month is to pick 30 or 31 ideas that Willard Garvey has thrown out and get rid of 29 of them. <laughs> so, I mean, this guy was like... But he wanted his best ideas to come back to here in Wichita. He wanted to make it a model city to be, quote, admired and imitated by communities elsewhere as the best place to work, raise a family, and enjoy life. So whether you loved him or hated him, there was a lore about Willard Garvey. And I tried to provide a sampling of it in the, in the book. Now, many people knew that Willard was an average swimmer. He was a great contributor to the YMCA programs, and he helped start the Wichita Swim Club. Willard was actually a championship swimmer uh, who swam competitively while in London during World War II and every day into his 80s. So if we were going to say, back to the Forrest Gump analogy, instead of run, Forrest, run, it would be swim, Willard, swim. <laughs> you 
You know, there were stories of uh, wet bathing suits and briefcases with toupees that I heard, um, squishy steps across the floor at home. You know, there was uh, water and Willard definitely were two of the same. He was really an exhaustive traveler with influential friends, including knighted investment giant Sir John Templeton and prominent families here in town, including the Beaches and the Lears of Wichita Aviation fame, the Cokes, the Loves, parents of friends and people in this very room. He liked to talk about people he knew in the places he'd been, including the exclusive Bohemian Club in California. He'd run around there talking with everybody from Phil Condit of Boeing, Al Newharth of USA Today, and British actor David Niven. Willard loved to brag about the people that he met. And from the stories I've heard, he was a downright hazardous driver <laughs> and definitely a worse pilot. I thought about uh, a title, Why Stop at Red, because apparently Red Lights and Willard didn't really agree. You, <laughs> so, I'm sure I'll hear some stories after this. Um, but he was a fantastic dancer and who once landed himself in a pool after one too many exuberant steps close to the edge. Then he went home and he changed into a new tuxedo, prompting the other guests at the party to assume that Willard was the only man in town with two tuxes. <laughs> I wasn't sure that story was really true. You know, one person tells you a story and you don't really know, and then I told it at the YPO meeting and somebody stood up and said, I was at that party! <laughs> And Mary uh, last night was telling her she was at home the night Willard came squishing through the front steps, you know, didn't say anything to change the tux and squishing out. But there sure was a lot to remember about Willard here at Rotary. You know, that fast-talking fellow in the back who gave dozens of speeches to this group over the years and later stood up under the guise of asking a speaker a question, where's Martin, and then going on and on and on and on and always about the same thing. Martin Eby reminded me of this and how he'd slink down in his chair when Willard would get up. <laughs> Here's a sample of a soundbite from one of his talks to this very rich Wichita club. It should sound familiar to those of you who followed him. Let's evaluate government. Government has become so complex and so expensive and so wasteful that it frustrates the ordinary citizen and stifles his initiative. I plan to emphasize what you and I can do to solve this problem with practical, constructive, positive projects starting locally. Economically, government spending appears out of control at all levels, and spending can only accelerate since there is no incentive and no concerted effort by anyone anywhere at present to reduce expenses or to seek efficiency. Sound familiar? <laughs> oh, oh, we already did that. <laughs> But here's the thing, that clip came, was from 1969. That was 44 years ago. Willard liked to say that he was a voice in the wilderness for 50 or 60 years, and it took the rest of the world that long to catch up. So in order to write the story of a man I really didn't know, I had to start here in Kansas. Here I found a romance that was very different from what I found when the, from the dusty desert where I first met him when I came to know his daughter, Julie, and later all the members of the family. But it was a romance with the Flatlands. I came to Kansas again and again and again to talk with some of you, and some have passed on. People we have been here too, Bud Barron, architect Sid Platt, the prolific historian Craig Miner, Willard's sister Ruth Garvey Fink in Topeka, and of course Jean, who left us 10 months ago. And I was so happy to get their voices, you know, their voices down. But with each trip, I came to fall in love with that warm wind that blows incessantly on a hot summer night, the long whistle of freight trains, but not the backup before they built the overpass, <laughs> and the sight of that mile-long grain elevator built by Ray Garvey. On one of these trips out to Jean's house, a friend and I, had, we had unearthed a collection of letters that uh, Willard had saved in a, in a trunk somewhere, and they were his V-mails from World War II and letters from his high school days, and you know, we found them in his home, and it turned out to be an amazing resource. It, it turned out to be a glimpse not only of a young man pushed into adult world of war, 
but really a window into his parents' pain and worry and longing for a child at war <laughs> in a city coping to deal with exodus of young men. And I have a reading on that. Hold on. By August of 1942, Willard was promoted to first lieutenant and that fall headed to Adjutant General School in Maryland. You will go through ranks like these like Eagle Scouts, I imagine, his father wrote, congratulating him on the promotion. I think you have the temperament, ability, and ambition to be and will be a fine officer and soldier. They were not easy words for Ray Garvey to write, even though he knew them to be true. It was easier, perhaps, for Ray to write about the businesses, the 21 little duplexes and 56 houses he was building that fall, or the 24 plexes just completed south of Wichita's Kellogg Avenue and east of Hydraulic Street. With so much effort and materials being diverted to the war, Ray could feel the pinch on his own businesses. The labor problem is getting quite critical, he said. We have plenty of carpenters, but only three or four laborers. Materials and utilities, particularly water lines, are hard to get. The story on the farms was similar. It is getting a little bit dif more difficult all the time to get competent help, he wrote. Since the war was taking all the young men, those left behind were either too old or too young. But as Willard's departure overseas drew near with the fading autumn light, Ray swallowed hard before writing his son. You mentioned once that perhaps you ought to make a will, he wrote. I am sending a couple of forms in case you wish to do it now. If you wish to send it home, we can put it in the family safety deposit box. He signed off like he did so many of his letters, with best wishes, sincerely, Pop. And there were so many beautiful examples of that and of emotions coming out. Uh, very slowly in the way that Ray Garvey could do it. The Army was really the place where Willard got uh, his first taste of bureaucracy, and I think it really uh, affected him for most of his life. <laughs> I'm glad you laughed at that. Um, so I had a lot of his copies back, to, letters back to his mother, and um, he wasn't content for long in the Army. He took a lot of tests, and he would be an administrator, and he would write that he was unhappy, he didn't like it. So he wrote to his parents about his discouragement with the army bureaucracy and his continued restlessness over his job. It was here in the war that Willard developed his animosity for wanton government spending. I want to see someone in the government who will cut out 90% of the bureaus and departments, he told his parents. Those parasites are self-generating and vicious. So he was saying it when he was in his 20s, you know. After the war, uh, he came back to Wichita and he married Jean. He called that his best, uh, best partnership ever. And their romance was well documented around town. Jean uh, got fixed up with Willard on a blind date and she saw him in his uniform. He was a major when he got out of the war and he came up the stairs and she said her heart skipped a beat. They went out on a date. She said he was the most fantastic dancer he'd, she'd ever seen and they started talking about marriage and the second date. And in Jean, Willard found the perfect partner. Friends and family say she was the one who softened so many of Willard's rough edges. She was charmed to his belligerence and patience to his furor. She attended family business meetings and came to understand the inner workings of the successful Garvey companies. She got involved in a host of community projects and reflected her husband's energy and enthusiasm at every step of the way. It was Jean, observers say, who often made Willard more tolerable. Oh, you, know, you know who you are there, too. In Willard, Jean found a worldly, driven, good-looking, and athletic man who idolized his parents, valued his siblings, and believed in American production and liberty. He was also reliable. After a day of roughing up people in the office, floating out dozens of new ideas, barking out challenges over the cost of building materials, or the not adherence to his ever-changing but mandatory organizational procedures, Willard would call Jean every evening at 5.30 to ask him if she needed him to pick up anything on the way home. He'd come in and give her a big smooch and we'd have dinner together every night, Mary Thoreau said. So theirs was a beautiful partnership in many, many ways. Sure, he made a lot of money, but he wasn't always motivated by profit. Willard's ability to overlook the bottom line was a small detail that used to uh, make his father and siblings kind of angry. And we learn about that in, some of the, in the chapter about world homes. He called that his single best idea. He lost millions on this overseas housing project, but took great pride in having to help helped people uh, have affordable housing in Peru and places like that. In a neighborhood called Sol de Oro in Lima, Peru, there's a plaque dedicated to Willard Garvey for providing housing to people in that, in that community. 
and Jean got to see it. She went on a trip to see it, and they gave her a little reception there. The late Epic Center architect Sid Platt, who I fell in love with when I was interviewing him, uh, a delightful man at age 90 when I talked to him, said, Willard built because he had to build. He had to build. And he, and he may have been an international businessman, but Wichita was really where Willard chose to make all the difference. Hold on. I got one more. Maybe. Despite pursuits in faraway places such as Peru, the South Pacific, and the wilds of Nevada, Willard Garvey did his most influential work in the city along the Arkansas River. Where you are is all that counts, he once said. You cannot solve problems that are in a vicinity where you are not. If you will solve the problems where you are, if each person will help their neighbor solve the problems where he is, all problems disappear because they are solved. That's a lot of what you guys try to do. Yes, Willard was famous for his anti-government stances. At Epic Center, he said, somebody asked him about how is it going to feel to look down on City Hall from the Epic Center, and he said, I can look down at City Hall from the sidewalk. <laughs> that's good. That's good, Mike. Good job. Uh, but he also offered solutions. You know, so, it's something we don't see today, I think. You know, here's a guy that, uh, he, he was dissatisfied, but he came up with an alternative. And he didn't, he didn't want a bond issue to be built to the new jail in 1986 because he thought the proposal was too expensive and he urged voters to turn it down because he said he could build a, a different design for much less. Do we hear of many people, business people, taking the time to do that kind of thing in their communities today? Here's another example of Willard's, one of Willard's long-standing ideas, one in which people, many people here may agree with today. Why not go private with City Hall, put them on an incentive basis, sell stock, and see, who, see where the co cost cutting would occur. Or why not merge city government and county government and save dollars and duplicate services? Last uh, Thursday at lunch with several of the commissioners of both bodies, I got a very dead silence and a very negative reaction to that suggestion. <laughs> so when he'd get on that horse, Willard would often back, back up his arguments, though. Let's go private with city. Whoops, okay. <laughs> we'll do it again. Let's go private. He'd back up his arguments with statistics and figures, and that could, it, it could turn your head around. I, I watched a video of his a debate with Tim Witzman over the jail, and it was a Sunday morning thing, and he was throwing out numbers, and, and you know, this, we could save this amount of money and that amount of money, and I, I had to watch it and put it on real slow about 10 times before I could hear what he was saying. So from that speech we heard in 1969 to the long-winded questions that some of you endured here at Rotary, Willard Garvey never gave up his fight against the government and, and could make it have fun of his efforts to do so as well. In 1999, Gene and Willard went to the museum in Washington, D.C. It's a museum for news, and couldn't resist the chance to do a little skit of their own when offered a chance to play reporter in front of a White House backdrop. Now, with the very latest information, this is a museum news update. Thank you for joining us. I'm Frank Bond. Museum Network News is following a developing story at the White House. We switch you now to our correspondent for a live report. Good evening. I'm Jean Garvey. I have just one question for you, Mr. Garvey. Why are you at the White House today? I'm Willard Garvey, and as you know, after a 60-year campaign, we've just completed the privatization of the United States government, and today we're going to auction off the White House to find out its true value for the benefit of all the American people over these 60 years of continuing growth in government. For that report, stay with <laughs> Mr. Network News as the story develops. So they, they even cut him off, right? <laughs> he was ready to go for another 20 minutes. <laughs> that was a fun thing to find. So Willard was hard charging really up until about a year before he died. He launched, oops, we're going back. He launched the President's College School of Law, another idea that he first floated in 1960. So he launched the President's College School of Law and it was an idea that he launched in, he first had in like the 60s to give business people a better uh, understanding of the law. 
Uh, he helped build, he started that and then uh, ran into financial trouble and after he passed it merged with Friends University where it's now the Garvey Institute of Law at Friends University. We ran into Dixie uh, over while I was here earlier, and he, she's just so excited. The kids are just so excited over there in this program. So it's another thing that Willard uh, put his mark on. And of course, the football field out of Independent uh, is just looking beautiful. So he never really stopped building, even up to his last days. One more reading. So for some, it wasn't just what, what he was saying that was so important. It was that he took the time to say anything at all. Seven-term Republican Mayor Rob, Bob Knight certainly withstood his share of ire from Willard Garvey, in person and in print, as evidenced in this one of his last letters to the editor, a volume of which could be written in a book up all its own. Why does Wichita Mayor Bob Knight, as the person responsible and accountable for City Hall, confirm again and again that City Hall is a cheat? Willard wrote to the newspaper in March 2001 in protest over the plan for a new downtown tax district. Bob told me, we didn't get along, we didn't agree on fundamental political values, and yet years after Willard's death, he believes both he and Wichita have lost something significant. Willard had enormous resources and he could have taken an easier path, Knight recalled, noting that Garvey purposely chose to focus on the minutia of local government. The former mayor can still recall Willard's voice at countless meetings, how he pressed him and other candidates to sign no tax pledges, and how he always, always spoke up about his mistrust of government and was a passionate defender of his freedom. In, in Wichita, he was a good citizen, Bob said. You know, he was a good citizen, and I think that's something we need to take away. In Wichita, the name Garvey is brandished on buildings, athletic facilities, and a host of educational facilities and programs. Willard Garvey took the service above self motto to heart, and whether you agreed or disagreed with him, I think there's a lesson in there all for us. Thank you for your opportunity to speak, and thank you for the interest in this book. No fingers. I made those fingers. Does anybody have any questions? Don't wave those foam fingers at me. No questions. Harvey has one. I think you did an excellent job of dancing with Willard. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.